Good morning to those of you in Europe. Good afternoon to those of you uh, east of Europe. Uh, hello and welcome to everybody everywhere. I'm Phil Middleton. I'm chair of the OMFIF Digital Monetary Institute. and I'm delighted to welcome you to uh, day three of our annual symposium uh, on all things digital and monetary. Um, this morning's session is rather optimistically entitled Transformation Across Asia's Payments Landscape, which is a vast subject uh, with vast complexity, um, Asia being a, a, an enormous expanse uh, of extraordinarily diverse uh, economies, countries, financial systems, financial infrastructures, with no such thing as one size fits all. Um, so we're going to hope to look across uh, many of the examples. In the digital revolution that we're starting to see, uh, accelerated partly by COVID, accelerated partly by uh, developments in technology in the digital uh, universe, um, we have seen an awful lot of very interesting development and experimentation uh, and indeed actualization happening in Asia. Um, we're all familiar with the uh, Chinese CBDC, the ECNY. There have been fascinating projects in Singapore, Udon, in Thailand, in Finland, uh, in Australia, uh, and, and indeed uh, Philippines, uh, India, and so forth, uh, amongst others. So apologies to those I've left out, but there's an enormous amount going on. And I probably hasten to to add probably leading the experimentation, the exploration, the development of digital currency uh, in the world. I think most of what is really actually happening on the ground is happening more uh, in Asia than, than, than just about anywhere else. Um, so I'm delighted today to have got a panel of real experts assembled. Um, thank you very much indeed, gentlemen, for, for, for joining us. Um, they are no particular order, Bermerto Tanganan, who is Deputy Governor of the Central Bank of the Philippines. They are Ozir Khan, who is Director of Digital Innovation and Architecture at the Asian Development Bank. And Atal Bouchar, who is Head of Product Banking Utilities at Partior, a new joint venture uh, looking at digital currency, and he'll tell us more about that later. Uh, so, Final thing from me is two little, two things. If you have questions for the panel, uh, either individually or collectively, um, please send them to us via our chat box, uh, uh, which you'll find on, on, on your screens. The team and I will, will, will get them to them. Uh, there is also a poll running, um, slightly lighthearted opinion poll, asking your views about the developments of different types of payment instruments, both electronic and physical in Asia over the next 10 years. And be interested if you, you just take uh, 30 seconds to, to, to fill that in and uh, uh, at the end, I'll, uh, I'll give you the results. So enough from me, um, we're gonna start by looking at use cases throughout the Asian region um, for digital payment instruments, uh, assuming that that's a vast uh, playing field of retail, wholesale, um, et cetera. And I'm going to start uh, with Deputy Governor Momento Tangalan of uh, the Central Bank of the Philippines, please, to, to, to tell us the, the Philippines experience. Over to you, Deputy Governor. Uh, thank you very much, Phil, and uh, good morning over there to you. Um, thank you for uh, inviting me to participate in this uh, great panel discussion on transformation across Asia's uh, payments landscape. Indeed, this is one topic that is very close to the heart of uh, BSP. Um, one of our uh, key focus areas is the digitalization of uh, payments. And uh, there are many imperatives behind that, um, uh, foremost of which are, of course, growing uh, trade, not only globally, but also within uh, the region. Uh, and, uh, and also in anticipation of uh, economies opening up 
and uh, travel and tourism once more uh, becoming um, livelier. Um, and also, uh, Phil, we are a country of uh, with uh, 10 million, about 10 million overseas Filipinos who are remitting uh, uh, money uh, to families uh, in, in the Philippines. And that's about uh, last year, uh, it's about like 31 uh, uh, billion US, which uh, roughly is about 9, 9 of our uh, equivalent to 9% of our uh, GDP. And I think um, um, many other countries would have half of that uh, uh, percentage of international remittance as a contribution to their uh, economy. So um, um, we are looking into improving, enhancing uh, where the uh, safety and efficiency of our uh, digital payment system. On the wholesale front, uh, we have uh, migrated and are already on the ISO 20022-based uh, RTGS um, um, and also on the retail payments uh, side, um, we are implementing a digital payments transformation roadmap. So we're done with the uh, electronics funds transfer uh, use cases. Uh, which accounted for about over half uh, a billion uh, transactions uh, volume um, last year. And these are both the batch uh, and the instant uh, electronic credit transfers. Um, for uh, um, late last year, we also launched the merchant payments uh, with the use of QR, QR code because uh, in our study Phil, 70% of our total retail payments transaction volume is, is in merchant payments. So that's, uh, that's key to our uh, achieving our objective of 50% uh, share of digital payments over total retail payments transaction volume by 2023. And uh, with uh, payments as uh, the, mo the most widely used financial service in the Philippines with 85% of our people um, using it, uh, payments, uh, we also want to use it to, to achieve a 70% uh, um, financially included uh, adults uh, in the Philippines by, by about the same time, in 20, by the end of 2023. So um, others uh, that, that we have lined up are interoperable uh, bills payment. Um, and also uh, a direct, an electronic direct debit uh, uh, system. Um, and uh, also we are looking at uh, launching the, the pilot of our uh, CBDC uh, towards the end of uh, this year. And that's uh, focused feel more on uh, wholesale payments where we see um, the largest uh, um, uh, impact that CBDC could could bring, um, given where given where we are right now with our digital payments uh, system, and those are of course uh, liquidity management um, use case and uh, security settlement and uh, cross border payments, which is I understand one of our um, key topics for this app. this morning or this afternoon. Thank you, Phil. So that's uh, back to you. Well, thank you very much indeed, Deputy Governor. There's more than enough there to keep you occupied for quite some time. <laughs> Two supplementary questions, really. Um, one, you mentioned you're going to uh, look very strongly at, at CBDC, Central Bank Digital Currency in the retail space. Do you envisage at some point that you will get rid of physical cash altogether? And my second question is in terms of your emphasis on wholesale inverted commas CBDC, does that imply that you will be permitting non-bank institutions access to the central bank's balance sheet? Uh, that's, that's, um, that's one of the things that we want to uh, explore, Phil. So uh, for um, the wholesale CBDC, uh, we, we want to give the markets uh, more room. So um, being 
making settlement uh, available 24 seven would be a, a, a very good uh, capability uh, to have. And uh, of course, a more efficient uh, cross-border payments is, is another. Um, so we can, um, um, I mean, given the objectives of other CBDC uh, projects like settling uh, multi-currency transactions in, in seconds, uh, that, that, that's, that's a very good proposition uh, for us. And uh, of course, Phil, we still have, uh, we still want to um, um, make the benefits of uh, CBDC. I want to leverage them on our uh, financial markets, uh, perhaps starting with uh, um, uh, fixed income or, or uh, sorry, uh, equities uh, securities. And um, that's why we want to pilot it and get our hands dirty, get our feet wet and uh, learn learn from uh, uh, the technology because there's so much to learn beyond uh, reading research reports and, and uh, projects of other uh, jurisdictions. So um, yeah, it's time to get into the action field. So still, I think reading between the lines then from a policy perspective, you're still thinking through whether or not to allow new institutions to have access to your balance sheet on the wholesale side because clearly it has major implications yes. in monetary policy. Yes, so Phil, Phil um, uh, for this pilot, uh, we are um, including our non-bank uh, electronic money issuers. So these are, um, um, I don't know if you're familiar with like uh, Gcash or, or PayMy, among other uh, products, but these are, well, these, these are fintechs, uh, fintech-based firms that are non-banks. Uh, yet have the need for uh, also for a uh, large value uh, settlement. Because right now, Phil, uh, they're, they participate in a retail payment system, but they're sponsored into uh, settlement by um, the participants in the RTGS. So if we bring them, that if we are able to uh, make them participate directly in, in large value uh, in uh, settlements, then um, I think it's going to make it um, even more efficient and safer. It, thank you. It, I mean, it, it has been a, a point of debate uh, increasingly over the, the, the days of the symposium as to whether or not non-banks should be allowed direct access to central bank balance sheet. Um, and there are some who say, well, yes, it's going to make everything that much smoother, efficient, more efficient. It's going to increase competition. It's going to increase liquidity. And there are others who say, hang about, there are uh, unforeseen consequences here for transmission of monetary policy and therefore not. And clearly, uh, some of the existing um, financial institutions are not too keen on the idea either for, for obvious reasons. Thank you very much indeed. That sets the stage beautifully. And I'm now going to pass the baton to Azir Khan uh, at uh, the, the Asian Development Bank. Uh, and without putting words into his mouth, uh, you've already introduced themes around cross-border, around migrant worker remittances, around financial inclusion, which I know are subjects that the ADB has been working on uh, intensively now for, for, for three to four years. But uh, over to Azir to tell us a bit more about that and, and other things. Azir, floor's yours. Thank you, Phil, and uh, very happy to be here in this forum. So yes, from a, from a developing Asia perspective, uh, you know, there are three themes that we see emerging, of course, around financial inclusion, trade, and to support the digital economy. Um, first, if you bucketize these use cases, um, one is about reach. It's about where high volume, uh, low value payments require support. Uh, and this is where we see uh, interest and uh, some real benefits um, as, as many are going through experimentation. Um, when the government has to reach out to include folks who may be in far off places without digital infrastructure, how best to do that? Um, and, and, and that's one of the areas that uh, uh, we're, we're seeing an interest. Uh, having said so, uh, something happened to me this morning. I'm an American living in Manila, 
And uh, I went to my office after two years or so, and I got uh, four or five stimulus checks, which I cannot cash because they came in too late. Um, so that shows the, the last mile piece on getting the payment into the hands of, of, of people and why digitalization is so important now. Uh, a, it is expected because we all know it can be done. Um, so just a real case uh, on a personal basis. Um, the other pieces that we are seeing in terms of interest and uh, use cases, uh, bactization is around uh, this whole, uh, in, in many developed economies, we have whole systems around EKYC, sanction screening, AML, but in many of the developing um, countries or areas, this is another area where um, a state operator can provide uh, a, a benefit, which is sort of opposite thinking uh, from a from a, uh, a developed uh, economies. Um, taking it further, um, in terms of uh, use cases, there is a lot happening in the full value chain around um, agriculture, uh, B2B, uh, peer-to-peer, -peer, um, that we're also seeing uh, traction. Um, lastly, I would say the efficiencies around um, uh, cash management areas, efficiencies around uh, when you go digital, you have more data. Of course, there are issues in terms of sharing of data, so on and so forth, but the fact that you have access opens up so many other avenues for, for value-added services for central banks and uh, commercial banks and fintech players in the um, in sort of the whole whole chain. Uh, so those are sort of the main areas of, of use cases uh, 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 that are out there right now. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, your point about series of checks is is is, is quite uh, illustrative. Um, I, I, in some ways, I think the defining moment of the pandemic for me was the point at which. Uh, the Chinese authorities sent stimulus money to a selection of their citizens electronically, and the US government sent paper checks uh, through the post, um, about a billion dollars worth of which were sent to people who were already dead. Um, and it just seemed to me to, to, to epitomize the, uh, the discontinuities that we have between various stages of development around CBDC. Um, one of the things that said, uh, you know, very practical use case in your part of the world, Philippines, I believe, has a couple of thousand inhabited islands. Um, Fiji is another example, has four or five hundred. And the difficulties of getting physical cash, literally, to, to, to people through monsoons and hurricanes is uh, a major, major problem. Um, but the, certainly in many parts of the world, the people we find keenest on digital cash are the revenue authorities who say, yes, it gives us wonderful data. And we then get consumer groups saying, hang about, you know, one of the great things about cash is its anonymity and our privacy is going. This is uh, indeed the... British House of Lords Committee even went so far as to suggest that CBDC was a potential instrument of state surveillance, uh, I quote. Uh, how, how do you see that at the ADB? Do you think that the utility is far more important than potential abuse? Do you think it's a, or do you think this is, this is a, a potential roadblock to uh, getting popular support for digital money? Um. We argue this all the time within our committees and meetings, uh, both sides here. Um, as, as we go through this, we're moving from analog to digital. Uh, paper on one side, people on the other side. And now we're talking digital issuance going into digital wallets. So they're both sides. Sometimes we only worry about the issuance part of the digital and not the wallet, the digital side on the, on, on the consumer side. So, how you design this whole CBDC or digital money, uh, the role of commercial banks in between or the role of the private sector vis-a-vis -vis the state uh, actors. 
uh, obviously, uh, when I consent with a private sector operator that they have access to my data, this is between me and the private operator. So that's one of the designs that we are seeing uh, where that privacy is between the commercial player and the individual as it is today. And then the digital piece is, is sort of with, with, with the state. So, so that's sort of one, one model. The other one is when it comes to certain use cases like migrant workers or where people who have no digital ID and people who are in, in areas where the need um, uh, trumps some of these issues. Um, so it's, it's very interesting that with digital cash, with CBDC, uh, you are not going to move from paper to digital as one to one. Digital money has so many other dimensions that you can create. One plus one is not equal to two in digital as it is in paper. Uh, so the design and the architecture uh, is going to play a key role in resolving some of the issues. And both you and the deputy governor have talked about the, the volumes of cross-border migrant worker remittances. What for you are the real pain points around this? What are the pinch points? Uh, cost. Uh, you know, when, when the cost goes beyond 5%, 7% per transaction, um, and when you look at uh, the volume of remittances that come in, when you compare that with a percentage of a GDP of a country, these are big numbers. Um, uh, so we have to bring that cost down. Uh, and, and, and that's one of the main sort of pain points. Of course, uh, we all want to be real time now. Um, you know, settlement um, over days is, is, is not expected anymore. Uh, but the cost that you pay for that is, is the one that needs to be uh, managed. Thank you. Uh, Phil, if I may add to that. Please. Yeah. Uh, another important element for us is, uh, of course, to um, um, instill trust and confidence among our uh, remitting, uh, sending and receiving uh, public. Uh, because right now, uh, many of the services uh, lack uh, transparency. So um, 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 many people um, kind of like lose trust. Uh, over its uh, use and prefer those that they understand. Uh, but if, if the service becomes more uh, transparent in terms of uh, uh, what fee goes into where, uh, then, then uh, this, this develops trust and builds usage, um, which after all, at the end of the day, we would want our population to uh, use and benefit from. Yes, uh, and this balance between trust on the one hand and privacy on the other and transparency and, 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 and the um, KYC on the other, is, I mean, is, is a very important part of this. And uh, I, I, personally, I find it rather surprising that the, uh, the same groups, certainly in, in the UK, who protest about invasion of privacy are quite ha happy to handle hand over all their data and details of their daily lives to social media organizations so um i i, I do yeah. find it quite uh, curious um yeah that's that's indeed uh those those issues are indeed uh, real and and very important but for an emerging economy like the philippines um very high up in our agenda is really to lift our people out of poverty and so the other uh uh issues attendant to that uh, would have to be managed. The same way like, you know, how we look at the, the virus. I mean, we have to reopen and then we just manage the, you know, what other negative uh, effects that might have. So I think I, I, I look at the, the approach as quite similar. Thank you. Uh, Atul Bushar at Partio has been sitting very patiently while we've been debating. So I'm delighted to bring, bring him in. Uh, Atul's had a, quarter of a century's experience in commercial banking uh, with a number of very well-known uh, banks, including uh, Citibank, H HSBC, uh, and DBS, to name but three uh, very major operators in payments right across the Asian region. Um, he's now heading a uh, product for banking utilities in, in Partior, which is a joint venture looking at a number of these payments issues. 
about which he knows far more than I do. So I'm going to pass the bat on to him and ask him to tell us something about it. Over to you, Atom. Um, thank, thank you, Phil. Um, and thanks for inviting uh, us to the Global DMS Symposium. Awesome to be here in the panel. A very warm welcome to the audience. Um, an interesting analogy which I use is, you know, really when it comes to global commerce is that the WhatsApp moment in global commerce is fast arriving. Now, um, do all of us remember when SMS and MMS were the de facto standards for text messages and then how WhatsApp disrupted text messaging and international calling? Um, a very similar situation is happening now as we have the shape of money getting reimagined, as we have new forms of money. And equally importantly, we have global networks like Partio. So effectively, it's the WhatsApp moment for both payments and global commerce. Now, just to kind of quickly introduce Partio. So we are a technology company that offer a blockchain platform for global value exchange. We've developed a global market infrastructure to accelerate value movement. Um, the platform is live since October 2021 with multi-currency wholesale payments both in US dollars and SING dollars, and on track to onboard major currencies and a number of different banks at different stages of onboarding. Our genesis is actually Project Ubin, which was a collaborative project between the Monetary Authority of Singapore and the financial industry to explore blockchain for both payments and securities. And thereafter, like you said, Phil, we were co-founded by Temasek DBS and JP Morgan. Now, while technology partners typically try to understand problems from the outside looking in, but here, we're in a unique position to address industry challenges due to both our roots as well as our partners. Now, Partio leverages on the native strengths of the blockchain, um, i.e. programmability, traceability, instantaneous settlement, interoperability, atomic settlement, and we live with commercial bank digital money or M1. In effect, we aim to reduce current friction and latency minimize post-transaction exception handling and reconciliation for payments. Now, in terms of the problems that we are solving is across industries and ecosystems. The first one, we've gone live with multi-currency clearing, cross-border payments, and then it's gonna be a very exciting roadmap across foreign exchange, payment versus payments, securities delivery versus payments, trade, escrows, and many, many more. I've, so Partio effectively is the global shared ledger for value exchange. I kind of you know, like calling it the new operating system for the digital economy. Now, just taking a step back to the original question you asked, well, in terms of the space of digital currencies and digital payment instruments. So if I look at digital currencies, it's a reasonably wide spectrum with the CBDCs on one extreme and the commercial bank digital currencies, stable coins, and then the cryptocurrencies. From a part of your perspective, we are very focused on the regulated digital currencies that's in effect CBDCs and commercial bank money or M0 and M1. And again, if you really kind of deep dive into the CBDCs and I know there is you know, the G20 program and clearly CBDC is a big enabler for the G20 roadmap for cross-border payments. It is in fact the building block 19 for, as part of you know, the whole G20 program. Now, from a part of your perspective, clearly a very interesting initiative that we partnered with the BIS Innovation Hub was really Project Dunbar which was exactly in this space. Now, BIS Innovation Hub worked with central banks across Singapore, Malaysia, South Africa, and Australia to actually have interoperability between wholesale CBDCs. RTO was a technology platform for the same, and we actually enabled the sandbox to be actually able to make this live uh, in, in a sandbox environment. So effectively, if you look at it, that's a very exciting space, and that wealth of experience the financial ecosystem is gathering is going to be built. And that said, the final point I would end with this, that said, uh, you know, if you look at uh, the retail CBDCs, which are live at this point of time, largely are retail CBDCs. You know, if you look at um, the Bahamas, uh, San Dollar, if you look at, um, you know, the Eastern Caribbean Islands, Dcash, Nigeria's Enaira, um, uh, China's ECNY, the pilots are obviously at very, very large scales, all of these in the retail space. Uh, so from a, a part of your perspective, we are agnostic and as and when, you know, the, really the M M0 solutions really, you know, go live from a part of your perspective, we would be, uh, you know, uh, supporting that. So in effect, yeah, going back to what I said, effectively, these are the exciting times and we're excited really to be the new operating system in this, in this new world. 
And does that assume then that you're looking to replace existing oper operating systems? I mean, uh, the mind automatically springs to uh, SWIFT uh, as the current backbone of, of, of cross-border bank-to-bank fund, fund, fund transmission. Uh, so, Phil, the way I look at it is, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, at the end, we don't necessarily compete with a certain platform. Uh, like I said, you know, we are in effect a market infrastructure for global value exchange, and and yeah, you know, I you know, typically whether it's payments, whether it's securities, whether it's FX, you know, clearly it's about what's the next generation market infrastructure, and and sometimes you know, I take this analogy of um, you know, uh, what is called the Cutty Sark analogy. So I don't know how many of you are familiar. Cutty Sark was one of the the, the, the fastest sailing ships, you know, the Clipper, which was, you know, somewhere in the 1800s. And um, it was the fastest in that whole realm. And it was just that it got launched at the time when that technology was getting obsolete and the steamships came into, came into being. So, you know, very soon, uh, you know, Cutty Sark was also and also ran because the steamships were fast, I was outrunning. So the way I would look at it is, it is, you know, clearly, uh, you know, about, like I said, right in the beginning, it's about the whole space is changing very fast. The new forms of money are getting created. And I guess the financial community and enterprises, you know, are, are, are the ones who would really decide what the preferred platforms will be. Uh, most diplomatic, but uh, can, can I just put you a little bit on the spot and say, um, and I appreciate your analogy with the, with, with the Cutty Stark with the tea clipper. I mean, you know, at, at, at one time, the British government in the mid 19th century opposed the introduction of um, iron ships, steel and iron ships. Why? Well, Britain at the time had the largest navy of, of wooden ships in the world, and they really didn't want those becoming obsolete. So, you know, yes, incumbent infrastructure will, will, will always um, argue a case that um, the known and the stable is superior to uh to the new and untri uh, untried and untested um but maybe anticipating a bit later is blockchain really a quantum leap forward from what we currently have um that's a great question um uh, I, I feel it's no longer about fomo with blockchain you know especially blockchain and payments value exchange it's 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 increasingly being recognized as a building block for the next generation of digital economy. Um, you know, the way I look at blockchain as a technology is there is a classic Amara's law, which says that, you know, we tend to overestimate the effect of technology in the short term and underestimate its effect in the long term. So the key question to me is what problems is the blockchain solving? What use cases is the blockchain being used for? And, and the way I look at it is, you know, broadly three key categories, you know, typically the blockchain um, you know, uh, facilitates the record of identity, now, whether it's for property titles, whether it's for licenses, certificates, provenance, traceability, sustainability, food safety. So that's, that's, that's one key pillar. The second problem it solves really is as a record or a proof of transaction, because transactions get recorded instantly, they get recorded on an immutable blockchain, now, whether it's for trade, whether it's for working capital finance, whether it's for bond issuance and servicing, so on and so forth. And then it's also a proof of obligation, regardless of whether it's an account-based digital currency, whether it's a token-based digital currency, you know, these, you know, on a, especially on a permission blockchain like, like Partio, you know, you can actually make all of this digitized and that enables, you know, especially with solutions like smart contracts. Money today is digital, but it's not programmable. And that whole concept of programmable money is really what drives two things, Phil. One, it drives efficiency, you know, classic cost, speed. Uh, you know, uh, uh, availability. And it more importantly drives innovation. And really the whole concept of programmability is what defines a whole series of use cases. I can go on and on, Phil, you know, for instance, I'll give you a few cases, a quick, you know, just a rattle off of three or four of uh, programmability. Things like one, um, payment pre-validation today, a lot of, um, you know, uh, beneficiary validation doesn't happen, or if it happens, you know, AML, CFT screening is all done sequentially. With programmability, you can do all of this on a concurrent basis. You can actually have conditional payments. You know, you can actually define predefined business rules, and these can auto execute. Now, whether it's for payments, whether it's for trade, you can actually have atomic settlement, settlement of digital assets, uh, whether it's for securities, whether it's for FX. So, uh, you know, uh, so I'm I'm really you know passionate about this, field, but just in the interest of time, I'll just you know kind of pause here. Uh, but but to me, it's 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 you know blockchain 
has to, it, it's it's only relevant for the problems that it's solving. It's not it's not uh, you know a, a magic wand which is going to solve uh, you know all problems in the world. But these problems is something where we we be very excited and we getting huge response from the financial community. You know based on what what they actually seeing value being given to the to the end customers. Thank you, Atul. You are you are clearly a passionate evangelist for this. Um, I'm interested that you say the you know the financial community because, again, I I have heard it said, repeating uh, over the course of this seminar that of course the uh, we need to keep the regulatory environment to very similar to what it is today to keep out uh, all the 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 unregulated and the uh, non-banking hoi polloi. Um, because of the threat to stability and this conversation that you, you postulate a world uh, that is transformed in many ways uh, and I just wonder whether one can restrict that to the current players whether one is de facto obliged to 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 admit all kinds of other people and I'm just going to ask the deputy governor who clearly has um, respect major responsibilities for financial stability in his portfolio about how do you manage the balance between innovation um, and financial stability? Uh, well, we have to ensure that our uh, payment systems remain safe. Um, that, that's the first and foremost uh, consideration. So um, we, we have a uh, implemented policies that align ourselves with the principles of financial market infrastructure to help us uh, keep to that track. Um, um, because uh, where, um, like in the case of our uh, large uh, value payments, it's, it's a, it, it is a source of systemic failure that's not handled uh, Properly, and we, we don't we don't want that. So we just want to we we have to ensure that um, while we pursue uh, innovation, uh, we also maintain, if not in, even enhance, the uh, safety of the uh, payment system. And, and does that mean that you are going to apply a more rigorous? Uh, looking glass to non-bank financial and so non-bank institutions coming into these markets than the, 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 the or, or, or a, a different regulatory approach? Uh, yes, Phil. Um, we, when we uh, bring new participants in, we need to make sure that we do not introduce any additional risk to um, what may already be there. Um, so, um, including having to, uh, of course, secure uh, the funds that, that uh, would have to be used by them for a settlement. So, um, we, have, we, we need to have those uh, arrangements to, to enable them so to, to participate. Thank you. Azir, are you seeing this? transformation that the that, that, that uh, Atul has, has spoken so so passionately about and, and, and do you think it's it is necessary or would you uh, lean more to the, those commentators who say actually let's there are a lot of improvements we could make to RTGS and existing platforms we don't need to, to, to throw over the whole apple cart to get there uh, uh, we, we've oh is that sorry Sorry, Atul, I think that's, uh, that may be for you. Apologies, I, apologies I'm on mute. mute. Uh, two days ago, I did one of these physically for the first time in three years. <laughs> Forgot about the mute button. Azir, it was, it was over to you. Ah, okay. Uh, no, absolutely. I think in Asia, especially, it's more on the transformation side than it's about incrementally improving current infrastructure. Uh, but having said that, um, your question about balancing the risk uh, is very interesting because any move forward will have risk. Uh, you know, there's no change without any risk. So as we tip to our way into this new digital cash money, CBDCs, so on and so forth, uh, 
the element of risk will exist currently with all the investigations, experimentation, pilots, uh, uh, transaction corridors, uh, all the new uh, sort of this 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 uh, new wave of technical infrastructure coming in, uh, the art of the sort of the possible versus practical, all that is moving fast. So how do you how do you move forward? I mean, how do you how do you balance this thing? And you know, in 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 sort of uh, logically thinking through, it's very difficult to go from zero to hundred. I mean, a lot of the thinking that we're doing here, you know, in the back of our mind, we're thinking we'll go from experimentation to large scale <laughs> uh, adoption in the next. No, it, it, you know, there are many incremental steps where there'll be a lot of learnings. Uh, any product development, uh, similar or any innovation, goes through iterations. I mean, you go from a investigation to experimentation to MVP to version one to version 100. By the time we're done, who knows? Maybe we'll have a, a CBDC and then we'll have a CBDC Pro and a CBDC Max, right? So I'm just making this up. But, you know, when it comes to uh, moving it forward, you know, how do you tiptoe your way in? How do you adopt the risk and develop your uh, policy regulation, but at the same time, give uh, air uh, to breathe for the innovation to move together as you're figuring out the policy and 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 uh, so the regulations around this. So it'll be an iterative process, um, uh, and the world, I mean, from what we're seeing, is moving a bit faster in Asia. To be honest, <laughs> uh, there's a bit more ambition here, I, if if I may say so, um, and because of that, um, uh, the experimentation is um, going much faster and the first versions are now, you're beginning to see them uh, come in. Thank you. And, and uh, Phil, for us, uh, it's really um, um, worth uh, learning and trying because, uh, um, for example, for CBDC, it has the potential to address some of our um, um, remaining inefficiencies, like, uh, for example, the, the 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 potential for 24 7 settlement for um a more immediate uh method of settlement for uh something that can bring cross-border payments uh, the cost of cross-border payments lower and these are these are uh, capabilities that are very relevant and very important for us here in, in uh, the Philippines. That's why it's worth, uh, it's really worth um, not only uh, looking into it, but you know, learning uh, how to uh, operate it uh, and build the necessary policies around it to ensure uh, safety of uh, the payment system. One of the things that, that we, I note about the, as you say, the experimentation, the learnings in the, has been the, the the range of projects that have been uh, undertaken in partnership between public and private sectors, a whole variety of uh, of things. We're seeing it to a certain extent in Europe. The Banque de France, in particular, has done about a dozen um, public private partnership projects in the in the wholesale space. But I just wondered if you could say something about what, what what's the the Central Bank of the Philippines view of the, that balance between public and private sector actors in this? Yeah, I think in, in this uh, pilot that we are um, uh, launching, um, we, we uh, have uh, private sector participants um, uh, coming from the, the commercial banking uh, sector, um, even, even up to rural banking uh, sector, like what in other jurisdictions would be called like community banks, um, as well as non-bank uh, electronic money issuers or like fintech uh, companies. So um, we believe that for um, uh, CBDC to be successfully, uh, if eventually launched in, in the Philippines, then, then uh, it cannot, the learning cannot be uh, accomplished in isolation. I mean, uh, we all have to uh, since we will be operating it and we will be transacting with each other, then we all have to uh, move.
move alongside each other and uh, together to, uh, in, in the journey uh, so that um, we, uh, as well as the uh, participants, uh, gain confidence um, in, in the, in the uh, use of uh, this new technology that will enable it to scale. Because we, we do observe central banks increasingly opening up uh, discussion and involvement in projects, which you know, 15 years ago was probably probably unthinkable. Um, Feds involved with MIT and so on and so forth. But how do you see that as there? In, 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 because you you have a, an overview over about 50, 60 countries. Um, yeah, no, uh, absolutely. I was just going to add that uh, um, this learning uh, needs to be together uh, with, with the players. If one player is experimenting uh, in, in the chain, we need to bring them together. This is what we are seeing. I mean, uh, uh, many of the pilots that we are involved in, we see uh, a central bank, but you see uh, many commercial banks involved. You see um, many major tech firms involved. You also see startups involved. You see fintechs involved. And the learning happens together. It's, it, I mean, to me, we call it, it you know, it's a team sport. Uh, this, this CBDC is going to be a team sport and not a state entity uh, thing is it, it won't be a private sector thing. Um, so um, bringing everyone together, sharing the learning, and this is where you know AMFIP also I think has a huge uh, role to play, especially the, this institute. Uh, it, we all need to learn together as we move to digital money, digital currency, because it 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 um, has ramifications which go beyond the walls of a country. Uh, when the minute you go digital, you go beyond the walls of a country, and then many other things come into play, uh, whether it's technical side or whether it's uh, others. Uh, so bringing everyone together is what we're seeing all across. Thanks. So let, let me just move, Atul just raised this, the, 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 this very important point about the, you know, the learnings for everybody. How much is this cross-border or how much should um, domestic um, improvement take priority where 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 is our balance uh, well, Phil, um, if you look at the size of the problem or rather the opportunity it's about 156 trillion dollars of global payments every year now uh, that's 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 massive that's huge now um, clearly if you differentiate between domestic and cross border domestic um, a lot of markets uh, have actually launched, uh, you know, instant payment schemes, and you've seen huge innovations, you know, whether it's payment push, whether it's payment pull. So a lot of that is an area where uh, we, we see a lot of um, efficiencies come in. Now that said, uh, we also realize a lot of that is in the local currency space. You know, so what what you know certain markets are talking to us about is uh, multi currency offshore clearing. You know, it, it it does happen in certain markets today on on the traditional payment trails like RTGS in Hong Kong, for instance. Uh, Philippines, Vietnam, Taiwan, you know, maybe, you know, the local currency in US dollars, but the multi-currency offshore clearing is, is, is one, um, you know, uh, you know, one, one infrastructure gap we actually see as, as, as something which is exists and that's where party does have solutions. But the interesting point uh, and the bigger, you know, I think, I think uh, challenge, which is the reason CPMI, G20, everybody is focusing on really is the cross-border space. And again, the, the, if you look at the pain points in the cross-border space, largely due to the traditional you know correspondent banking model of multiple correspondent banks introduces um, you know high and unpredictable costs uh, it, it 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 slows down the speed of payments um, the questions around uh, you know end to end visibility uh, and and especially in markets like asia pacific um, even latin america you got to realize that the key friction is also the fact that the regulatory requirements for cross border payments are very diverse and when you actually do a deep dive, you realize that um, you know they vary from market to market. Money moving out of the country, money moving into the country, whether you need to submit documentation, whether you need to submit information, um, you know it changes based on the purpose of payment, changes based on whether you've got transaction level amount caps, annual amount caps, depending on whether you're a consumer or a business. All of these add friction. And again, these are classic um, use cases for disruption 
because you know today that last mile is the one which actually makes the end to end you know uh, you know working capital and and the efficiency you know for the global digital economy slow and if you now contrast if you actually now you know uh, you know uh, look at how these problems can be solved and i know about Ozier and deputy governor memoto you know really have been you know talking about a balance really if you look at i've talked a lot about programmability but i won't talk much about that but even things like you know this whole automated regulatory checks whether it's for regulations whether it's for fx whether it's to be able to do automated checks with the regulatory database or customs or ports all of these can be automated and all of these again you know bring huge efficiencies the atomic settlement which i talked about the conditional payments i talked about um, you know the fact that with reducing the number of hops and skips in the payment chain you bring in cost efficiencies and predictability you bring in transparency um, you bring in even conceptually value added services and again subject to the policy frameworks a shared kyc utility so the opportunities really on the cross border space to address these payment problems are phenomenal and and the way i see it is yeah you know uh, again an analogy I always love using is uh, you know in, from ice hockey that you know the question is are you skating to where the puck is or where is where is going to be and and that's what you got to think about you know where the puck is going to be and then you plan uh, your uh, you know solutions investments infrastructure everything you know in that space i thought thing about ice hockey was you watched a fight and suddenly an ice hockey match broke up <laughs> Um, but um, it's interesting they're picking up. So uh, one of our audience has, has referred to the latest BIS survey on uh, uh, cross-border and saying that the uh, developed market central banks seem to be somewhat less interested in cross-border efficiency improvements, whereas the, all, all the action is in Asia. And uh, uh, both yourself and, and, and Ozia seem to be very much emphasizing that, that there is a there is a tremendous amount. So let me just go back and say you, you're envisaging a world of a changed operating platform that is delivering a whole new set of concepts of digital means of payment. This is far goes far broader than just simply saying we're going to turn a uh, a $20 bill into a $20 digital token. This is, uh, and we are going to upend the current cast list in financial services. So we're going to introduce new actors and players uh, to this game because we want innovation, we want competition and, and, and so forth. Um, Azir has, I think, very rightly raised the issue of risk and instability. I'm going to start with the deputy governor because he's official sector. How on earth do we regulate all this? Um, when the customer can be in one country, the server can be in another, and uh, the reserves can be can be stuck somewhere else. Um, it seems to me that I, you know, do we upgrade our existing regulatory architecture, or do we need to create a, an entirely new one? I think feel there's room for like uh, collaboration uh, to to um, ensure uh, alignment because uh, as what uh, Director um, Khan and uh, also Atul mentioned earlier that these uh, pres do present or uh, um, uh, asynchronous uh, uh, policies and processes uh, do present challenges in cross border uh, payments that. Um, uh, Perhaps one of the reasons why why there is some inefficiency, uh, some more inefficiency in it. So um, uh, we need to work with um, uh, the other uh, central banks in in uh, other jurisdictions, and uh, I reckon they will also need to work with their supervised uh, institutions and see uh, how we can uh, align. Um, after all, at the end of the day, our common objectives would really be to make uh, uh, the service on cross-border payments uh, safer and more efficient. So, I mean, for, for example, this weekend, we've had a stable coin, an alleged stable coin, uh, depeg on multiple occasions. People may have lost uh, money. The institution concerned 
it's, as far as I can see, is not regulated by anybody. Uh, what, what would the view be in, in, in Manila if citizens came to you and said, hey, I've, uh, and I appreciate you don't wish to comment on US uh, regulatory activities, but how, how, how would you look to protect Filipino citizens against this sort of thing? Or would you say you're on your own chum? Uh, yes, Phil, we adopted the policy on uh, regulating what we call the val um, virtual asset uh, service yeah. provider. So we, in, in a way, we kind of like uh, regulate how um, uh, digital currencies, especially uh, private ones, are um, become uh, or are converted to fiat and vice versa. Um, and also, alongside that, uh, we uh, promote uh, awareness among our population that um, uh, there are risks in, in dealing with uh, virtual uh, assets uh, beyond the usual monetary uh, risks on exchange rates, but, uh, uh, even valuation or other other risks that, that uh, are present there. So um, if, if, uh, if they are to go into it, then the, we advise them to, first of all, be knowledgeable about it, know the upsides and downsides. And um, um, uh, again, we kind of like uh, supervise uh, uh, where, where they, where, where uh, digital currencies cross over to FIA. Um, so uh, we, in that way, we are protecting both the population and, and the payment system. Yeah, and I think it's one of the big themes coming out of this annual symposium has been that policing the on and off ramp between fiat and crypto worlds is going to be absolutely vital in a whole range of uh, issues around risk, around stability, around consumer protection, around KYC, AML, CFT, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I think that's that, that is coming forward loud and clear. Gentlemen, we have got about five minutes left. Um, what I'd like to put you on the spot now is to say, we've discussed a fascinating new world. Uh, and in many ways, I feel like we're in act one of the opera. Uh, we've had the overture, which has been very, very exciting. And the main characters are starting to come on stage. What do you think we've talked about is here very eloquently talked about the, the, the step by step, we're not going to get to the final act for a while. What's the next big important thing that has got to happen to move us along this journey? I'm going to start with Atul. Sorry, Phil, is it for Azir or me? No, for Atul, sorry. Ah, okay, awesome, yeah. Uh, so Phil, uh, the journey is, is, is already uh, on track. Uh, what I did say is uh, a lot of digital disruption, a lot of innovation, um, you know, I know COVID has been uh, a, a tragic, you know, uh, but, you know, the whole historical divide before COVID, after COVID, AC and BC, I think it's it's changed the, the digital adoption across consumers, businesses, regulators are looking at cashless digital economies. So I think this this movement is irreversible. Um, I'm just conscious of time. And, you know, and frankly, the way I look at it is it's kind of uh, Charles Darwin's theory of evolution. I think I think this is this is really how financial market evolution happens. So it's exciting times. I can just give you and the audience the uh, results of the poll that have just come in. We asked in 10 years time, what do you expect to be the most popular method of retail payment to be across Asia? And the answer is 40% uh, of respondents uh, think it's going to be e-wallets, such as Apple Pay. 37% think it's going to be CBDC, i.e. digital fiat money. Uh, 7% think it's going to be cryptocurrency and 7% think it's going to be fiat cash. Um, so 10 years time, we're still expecting 7% of retail payments in physical cash. That's interesting uh, or not, as the case may be, but that's what our, our audience today thinks. Let's here briefly, uh, what, what gets us to act two of our opera? Act two. Well, first of all, I think after act one, act two will definitely follow. Uh, there is no, no doubt on that. It's, it's kind of tough to see which direction is going to move. Uh, you know, the first mile and the last mile that we always talked about, I don't know which way the traction is first going to happen. Uh, but 
to me, the second act will be where it gets adopted and where it gets adopted can be either on the opportunity side or it could be on the digital literacy side where now crypto is, I wouldn't say going mainstream, but is getting more adopted. Uh, so maybe that is going to push uh, uh, us in, in, in sort of act, act too faster. There are multiple options, very difficult to predict which way, but it will move. Thank you. Uh, so I'm hearing from my, my, my librettists and my musicians actually evolutionary score rather than a revolutionary one. Deputy Governor, final words for you. Do, do you agree or not? <laughs> uh, well, well, I agree, Theo. Uh, um, in, in, in our uh, case, uh, well, first of all, uh, I think that uh, openness is a key element uh, in all uh, participants. There's, a, there's an increasing uh, demand from our users, consumers and businesses, and even our government. Uh, for a more efficient uh, and cheaper payment system, yeah. uh, domestic and also uh, cross-border. Um, so um, with that uh, pool or, or uh, demand, then we need to find uh, ways that are increasingly becoming uh, feasible. And uh, the next I would say after openness is uh, collaboration. We need to continue uh, conversations and uh, exchange of knowledge with the uh, technology providers on, on uh, what, what can be leveraged, um, as well as, of course, uh, especially with our market players and participants, as they are the ones who are expressing the real need, uh, not only of them, but also of their customers. So um, I think uh, we continue with this too, uh, openness to innovation, um, Okay, uh, there's a work to be done in policy changes, but so be it. I think the the fruit <laughs> is is um, or the benefits of it would be way 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 much worth the the the, the effort and the cost. And so let's proceed with it, and uh, we continue the the collaboration. As as the director Khan mentioned earlier, everyone all stakeholders need to uh, proceed. Um, uh, you know, uh, in step with each other. Otherwise, uh, uh, it, it, it would never get uh, off the ground, even after you implement it. Well, as you very kindly pointed out, uh, openness, collaboration, conversation, dialogue in this space is exactly what OMFIF Digital Monetary Institute is, is all about. I'd like to thank the three of you very much indeed for your, your contributions to this dialogue. We could go on for, for, for quite some time without probably reaching an answer, but it, it has been an enormous pleasure and terribly educational uh, talking to the three of you. Uh, so on behalf of OMFIF, on behalf of our audience, I'd like to thank you very much indeed for, uh, for your contributions uh, uh, this afternoon uh, and wish you uh, a, a very good uh, rest, rest of the day. Um, thank you to our participants. Um, the symposium continues over on another channel, so um, please, please stay with us. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Phil, and my fellow panelists. Thanks.